We've got an awesome um, two guests today to talk about what consumers are going to look for when this is all over. So we sent a poll out a few weeks back asking and having a lot of conversations with our retail friends to understand what's top of mind. And of course, it's the uncertainty. Beyond the triage and the reopening right now, it's really trying to understand when we get over this, and hopefully it's sooner rather than later, but you know, we see how things are going, what is the consumer going to look like? Right? They say it takes 66 days for, ha for, um, for behaviors to become a habit. So we went out and we were trying to find someone with a crystal ball, and we actually did find someone. His name is Brian Solis. He's a futurist. And uh, with that title, he's going to come on in just a minute and talk to us um, about the, some pretty interesting research he's done into how the consumers change and what retailers should be thinking about as we look to the future and, and going into this further into this decade. Um, so, but before we get started, again, with the rollout, as Jason was attempting to say with, uh, unfortunately, some of the tech issues, is that we want this to be interactive. So it's great now seeing in the chat a lot of friends, people that unfortunately can't see live and in person at the moment. Um, but of course, welcome to people that this is your first experience or interaction with us in retail spaces. Um, in the chat, just like any other webinar, of course, chat along, um, comment on things that we're going to be discussing. But we have a Q&A section there. So if you have questions that you're, you'd like to ask, please put that in there. We're going to try our best to try to you know, bring you in. We also have a number of polls that we'll run. Um, so we'd like to get your feedback on certain things. So we're going to demo that just for a quick second here. Um, I'm going to bring up a few polls just to get a read. And again, this is on behavior. How has, you know, since this uh, pandemic started and how we've been forced to use technology and certain things and change the way we, we consume, uh, consume products and purchase procure products. Um, are you buying more on, on, items online today compared with last year? I'm just going to start this poll um, and love to get everyone to um, give us your feedback. Have you been buying more items online today compared with last year? A lot of people, um, of course, you know, we're buying most of their stuff online to begin with, but um, we'd love just to get that. And obviously this is an opportunity to see how the polling system works here in the big marker platform. Um, so yeah, um, as we see it coming in right now, it looks like 80, 89, 90% of people have been buying more items online today compared with last year. Um, and also run another poll here. Have you tried Bopis for the first time or start relying on it more over the last five months? So yes, is it first time user? Yes, it's increased or no, this has not changed for you. Um, and you can see the results of the poll in the tab on the right hand side. You see chat, Q&A and polls. Um, so in there, if you want to see the results, you have to uh, submit the poll to see it. And then one further poll is uh, along the same lines um, is, has your use of food delivery apps changed since the start of last year? So we'd love just to kind of just get a read on the audience here on where things are going. I think we, we all know what the answers are, but just wanted to set the stage here before we bring Brian on to understand kind of really how us as consumers, even though we are retailers or suppliers in the industry, how even our lives have changed. So we've got 84% of people said that they've bought more items online today compared with last year. We've got 29% said they've increased BOPIS, 30% 30 have actually just used it for the first time, and 39% know it hasn't changed. And then currently we've got 38% um, of people increased their um, their food app, uh, using food apps, and 45% hasn't changed at all. So that's actually pretty interesting. I guess that really depends on where you are. Um, here I'm in New York City, and a lot of us sort of locked it down. You know, we rely on food apps uh, pretty much to dining uh, before we open. So before we bring up um, Brian Solis, um, just wanted to, you know, kind of hit on one thing. And it's not necessarily the most positive thing to bring up, but it's a reality. And that reality is this, it's that UBS analysts predict that 100,000 stores potentially, not a typo, will be shuttered by 2025. Um, it's a reality that we knew was coming, but of course has been accelerated by COVID. So um, on that note, I'm going to bring on Brian, who's going to take this not easy stat to digest, but talk about the opportunity and where things are going. And uh, hopefully we're going to come on the back end of this with some positive things to talk about and the opportunity. Look, the one thing is, is that this is, you know, we say new normal and we don't want it. We're going to try not to say those those terms, um, but it is the reality. And as soon as everyone accepts that and understands where things are going, um, we can make retail a lot better. So without further ado, let's welcome our friend, Brian Solis. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, wait, we had, we, 
See, this is what happens. We, we had a little intro video, but you know what? Let's just get right into it. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually pretty cool, though. Uh, so thank you. Man. And uh, no better way to get started than to jump right in. It's good to see you, Michael. Yeah, you too, man. I mean, so just for some context for people that may have tuning in here um, that actually went to our restaurant spaces event. The last time Brian and I saw each other was on the eve of March 1st. We were sitting because Brian was our opening keynote speaker um, at restaurant spaces on March 2nd on a Monday morning. But we were sitting in the bar that night and we had the CEO of Taco Bell speak and we we're all like, is this really happening? And that's when the travel ban started coming to play. And now fast forward, you know, five months later and you're in your own studio that you made in Lake Tahoe um, giving talks uh, with the blue screen behind you. So how's life been for you? <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's certainly interesting. And you can see firsthand on how not only shopping or just the world is changing, but also how temperaments uh, are changing as well, mm -hmm. especially uh, in the US. Uh, I, I have been speaking globally from Lake Tahoe uh, over the last several several months. And I could tell you, though, one of the most interesting things, uh, and for those joining around the world, I'm sure you could attest to this, uh, is that it, it's been frustrating from my standpoint to, to be presenting to executives uh, and at events where people are actually in the office. I, I, I presented to an event at an event in New Zealand. And uh, I said, wow, this is amazing that everybody's sort of in, in your office. I'm sitting here in shelter in place. Uh, and someone replied, uh, yeah, actually, right down the street is, uh, is a football event with a full arena. <laughs> huh. Wow. Yes. So, yeah, in, 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 interesting time. So, you, you know, I've, I've known you, I've been following you for years, and uh, we've got to know each other. You've spoken at a number of different events, and you've written a lot of interesting books. Um, but, you know, we've really been kind of focusing on where technology is taking business just overall. And luckily for you, perfect timing is you found a full-time gig just before this whole thing started because I know a lot of your businesses come from being out on the road speaking, but you're now a global uh, evangelist, innovation evangelist for Salesforce. So just before we get into that, kind of maybe you want to explain to the audience kind of your role there now with Salesforce. Yeah, absolutely. So before before joining Salesforce, for those who don't know, don't, don't know me or my work, I'd been a digital analyst and a digital anthropologist for a good couple decades. And that translates into a lot of research a lot of books, uh, and then also a lot of speaking about how technology was affecting markets and also behaviors so that I could reverse engineer them uh, and make sense of them to executives looking to make decisions about digital transformation, customer experience, uh, retail innovation or retail design. Uh, I spent the last several years in, in advising the design of autonomous vehicles. Uh, so it's had me, it's had me in, a, in a variety of, of if industries, but it's all been from a human-centered perspective. And joining Salesforce actually is, uh, is, is, is a company, it was the only company that I was looking or open to joining because the team itself is very much focused on customer success. And I get to, within my role, continue to study everything that I've studied before, but now also have direct application of innovation, pilots, insights, you know, a direct line to get uh, companies to experiment or open or who are open to experiment uh, in really, really cool ways. And I hope uh, someday soon to share some of the uh, some of the really amazing out there work that's coming to light right now. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, an amazing company. So let's, let's dive into it. So, you know, you've been doing a lot of, uh, I guess, gathering a lot of data on changing consumer behavior. So what have you noticed? Yeah, well, I'm going to take a step back just so I can tee it up here for everybody. Before okay. COVID-19, or as I uh, refer to it as BC, uh, I talked about a, a concept of consumer called Generation C. And Generation C stood for connected, uh, which was the rising majority of customers who were digital first or mobile first. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you studied their behaviors, whether it was through the customer journey, whether it was what they aligned with in terms of brand values, uh, whether how that digital parlayed into physical design, for example, uh, I, I started to see incredible uh, opportunities for innovation. Uh, and now after COVID or after disruption, I call it AD, I have hyper studied what has happened actually since we last saw each other. So post March 1st, is when I started to see a lot of customer behavior change in two ways. 
now I call it Generation N, Generation Novel, which is anybody who was part of Generation C. So if you were a BOPIS, if you were a delivery, uh, if you were an Uber user, if Lyft user, uh, all, all, all the stuff, you've now accelerated those behaviors. Mm -hmm. Now, because of shelter in place, uh, because of closures, we have a new group of, let's say, late market majority users who are now becoming, by default, digital first. Uh, so now you have a greater segment of people who now are going to define the future of your business. The thing about digital is that it completely changes your expectations, your behaviors, your preferences. Um, it puts you right at the center of everything. Uh, and you're, if you call the phone sort of like your remote control for life, it puts you at the center of a real-time world where you're the center of the universe, right? So mm -hmm. I, I, basically digital consumers, I, I joke, say uh, that they become accidental narcissists uh, because you could have what you want, when you want, however you want. Hmm. Uh, just to give you an idea, before COVID, I had studied how long was too long. Uh, if you were in New York, for example, uh, back in the days where you could be free outside, uh, you, if you called an Uber, you know, how long was too long to wait for an Uber before you opened the Lyft app? Uh, and that research I did every year to show that that number was going to go down as a means of saying we're becoming increasingly impatient. So the last time I had run that research, which was a few years ago, uh, the number was six minutes. So if a car was further away than six minutes, you would just by default open the other app because why would you wait more than six minutes for a car to come to you? <laughs> you yeah. know? Uh, and that, you know, now you have, for example, <clears throat> Amazon Go stores, you have these new Amazon uh, carts that, you know, take out the, the, the checkout line, the whole checkout process. And you start to see, essentially, we're designing for a consumer that doesn't want to wait, that wants everything now, that wants everything seamless and intuitive. And it's all as a result of digital. Now, I'm just going to add one more layer, and then I'll throw it back to you for you know keep the Q&A going. Uh, now it's not just digital. Now you have to add into the mix a somatic marker. Uh, and the somatic marker is COVID-19. We have been through the worst. We've been through some hope and aspirations. Now we're kind of uneasy about where we are and where we're going. Uh, of course, there's politics in all of this. And so now we have an emotional attachment to these times that, like digital, binds us closer together at, on a digital aspect and also an emotional aspect. And now this means that brands don't have to just be more efficient. Uh, they don't just need to introduce uh, intuitive BOPIS or delivery experiences. They don't need to just think about uh, what's going to be in terms of retail innovation inside the store. They now have to consider what are the emotional elements a customer has. And I've noticed in the, just in the last 90 days alone, uh, it has continued to evolve. So I'll give you an example. Most customers, most consumers are worried about their own health. They're worried about the health of their loved ones. They're worried about the impact of COVID on their jobs and personal security, also that of their loved ones. Uh, and they're worried about things like essential supplies, like toilet paper is still in many stores, a, a, a difficult thing to get. Uh, yeah, and I so know. now, and, and one last thing, they're also concerned about how well brands are treating their employees. And so this means that yeah. the, the humanity of all of this needs to also be reflected in terms of how do I communicate health, safety, security, uh, empathy. Yeah to customers aside from just a digital track. Yeah, and that's something we're gonna get into with Vibhu Norby, uh, our, our guest yeah, uh, for the next segment here. And, and he's been doing some interesting stuff and, and tracking that actually. Um, so, you know, so it's, you know, it definitely interesting times to say, you know, to put it lightly. Um, <laughs> so what does it mean for stores then? You know, I mean, you know, and, and that's such a broad thing to say because you have essential stores, you have, you know, the convenience and groceries and people that still need to get their toilet paper, right? Um, but apparel's been hit really hard. Um, specialty retailers, mall-based retailers. You know, are, I showed that stat and someone asked the question in the Q&A there, you know, is it individual stores or 100,000 businesses? Individual stores is what I believe from that stat from UBS. But I think we saw it today as Cena just, you know, is filing for bankruptcy. I mean, it's, it, we're going to see a lot through this. And, uh, you know, if you're someone right now that's solely responsible for thinking about the physical real estate portfolio, what do you think is the things that they should be thinking about as they start planning? Because right now, most all developments been put on hold, right? Mm -hmm. Anything they're doing is kind of right now, it's just trying to the triage, let's get reopened. But as you're going through the end of this year here, 
retailers have to really start rethinking about you know their formats and dark stores and uh, you know it, it, going further with Bopis and other things. And again, it's everything's different from you know the different types of retail. But um, you know, if there are two things that that you think should be top of mind for someone, if you're wearing that hat as a head of store development, store design, um, what are they? It's the million dollar question, Brian. Yeah. Well, look, I'll, I'm going to start by prefacing this with this is none of this is new right this was all aside from aside from a global pandemic i mean we were already seeing retailers struggle because they were they were essentially creating these analog first experiences mm -hmm. and trying to adapt them to a digital world whereas my research for the last decade at least has shown that the consumer has become much more impatient much more demanding uh, in yeah. we could go on for that for the next couple of hours of all the things that they want but now when you add this health component into it essentially let's let's take a step back let's let's ask some questions that weren't in the polls uh for example uh okay. are you buying are you buying less uh for example one of one of the one of the behaviors that has accelerated because of covid is uh conscious consumerism uh and, mm -hmm. and not just not just sustainable sustainability or what have you but I mean, like the Marie Kondo movements, like, do I do I have too much stuff? Is my relationship with brands and my relationship with consumer goods, uh, has it been misguided or misdirected over these years? Because COVID's forcing a control alt delete and it's forcing people to reset their values and their beliefs. And so what brands and retailers need to understand is what are those values and beliefs that I need to align with? Because then we can take those cues from a digital first standpoint, like much in the way that Amazon takes those digital cues and applies it to physical retail, but also looking at ways, how can we communicate a better, more personalized experience like we get you we hear you uh we've got your safety in mind and here's what our retail stores are going to become so like with beta you've got a whole new product set of which that you're catering to people that they know that people want because data they're a data first business uh they're also uh they probably in a physical way act a lot like a d2c company uh understanding that hyper connected customer and what's important to them this by the way all this data is is more available than ever before post March 1st. And so you have to yeah. become a data culture organization, organize the entire cross-functional organizations around centralized group that is interpreting this data in an unbiased way. Uh, that's actually the hardest part of this whole discussion because what you're gonna find is a lot of insights that show that you were actually on the wrong path before COVID. Uh, for those who wanna do homework after this, I've written a series of posts around the novel economy. It's what I call the new normal. Uh, it, I want you to think about these times as not the new normal, but as an interim normal. This is a time where we don't have the confidence uh, to necessarily move forward strategically. So we're trying to have conversations like this, but also at the same time that we have the confidence to know that we don't want to go backwards because that was part of the problem to begin mm -hmm. with. And in the novel economy, it's broken out into three phases. One is survive. This is where we are. Business continuity. We're freaking out. Uh, we're having to enable, you know, working from home all over the place. We're having these conversations. But here's where things get interesting. The next phase is alive. And it's not about how do I batten down the hatches? How do I file for bankruptcy? How do I cut costs? Uh, this is actually counterintuitive. And historically, any time of disruption, not just a global pandemic, of course, Historically, we've seen that companies that invest in answering the questions that you just asked are the ones who do better moving out. So in this interim normal, uh, what are we going to do differently? What does retail mean in 2020, 2021? Uh, it doesn't have to be what it was before coming into this. Uh, and then lastly, uh, we set the stage for phase three, which is thrive. So we're making investments in both iterations, so improving what's working, and also innovation in creating new value in store, Bopis, digital. What else? Mm -hmm. What else are we not doing? Dark stores, stores becoming distribution centers, uh, and then building that out, building the expertise, building the infrastructure, building the framework, building the data organization, so that we can survive, uh, thrive, and uh, in in phase two and three. Yeah, that, that, that's great. So I, I'm just looking at the questions here, and I want to remind ask people that if you've got questions, you got comments. If you're disagreeing with anything, or you want to comment. Obviously, you can put it in the chat, but the Q&A section is where to do that. So Kurt Brooks uh, from Mohawk. Hey, Kurt. Um, he said he gets that most of uh, urban America is digital first. But what about 50 percent of the country who still live in rural America? Are you saying they are digital first? They're becoming they digital first. 
uh, because they have to. Uh, and it's not, it's not to ignore non-digital customers, but I can tell you this, that my research shows before COVID and also after COVID is once you get that taste of convenience, once you get that taste of personalization, uh, you don't go backwards, right? Uh, there's a saying about, you know, what, what's the relationship between iteration, innovation, and disruption. Iteration is doing the same things better. Innovation is yeah. trading new value. Disruption's using that new value in ways that make the old things obsolete. So essentially what you do is even if you're not digital first, the insights that you get to cater to a digital first customer, everybody benefits from because it's faster, it's more intuitive, it's, it's, uh, it's cleaner, it's a healthy, it's a much, much more safe, mm -hmm. uh, safe experience. So I just got a couple more questions and I'm just being conscious of time here. You know, as a futurist and just kind of going, you know, longer picture here, take COVID off the table. You know, if we were back March 1st and or let's maybe back February 1st and I were to ask you, Brian, what do you think will be the biggest disruptions of tech innovations or maybe not even just tech over the next 10 years that you think will change the way we live and shop in the next decade into this decade? What do you think they'll be? Super fast answer, as fast as I can make it, um, but also as meaningful as I can make it. Uh, Michael, as you know, I wrote a book called Life Scale before this, mm -hmm. uh, and it was already starting to predict that our relationship with the world, our relationship with stuff, our relationship with each other was becoming uh, much more. Oh, that was wow. That's pretty <laughs> <laughs> Man, was, was actually on a path. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually on an unsustainable path. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we would have had this conversation about rethinking the brand relationship with the consumer by understanding what was what was important to them, where were they struggling, uh, and where could we add light uh, in their darkness, right? And COVID only accelerated all of those things, right? So now mm -hmm. you have a you have a consumer. Let's let's just be straight here. We've we've got a we've got a pandemic that's probably going to be uh, like this uh, in terms of what we're seeing for the next twelve to eighteen months. Uh, mm -hmm. The best case scenario is a vaccine or treatment that is released in January. That's the best case scenario. And it's going to take several months for that to roll out uh, mm -hmm. at scale and establish that herd immunity that we need. Uh, so we're we're in that phase two right now where we have to start planning for the future of retail right now with consumers at the center of all of this. You have a consumer that has in the last several months jumped from I'm willing to go out and start shopping again to I am not at all there. In fact, 80 something percent just came out last week. I can't remember the, st the, the source. 80 something percent had said that they're not ready to go back to physical shopping in the way that they used to. Mm -hmm. uh, and that number jumped 10 points from the month before. Uh, and so we're talking about July and June. Uh, yeah. So we have to understand that by placing the customer at the center of all of this, understanding the data of what they want, what they don't want, we have to kind of relearn and also unlearn who this customer is and what's important to them at, a, at, at that somatic marker level. What's their relationship with stuff, whether that's apparel, whether it's workout equipment, whether it's camping, outdoor gear, uh, and understand then how can we reverse engineer those insights into a digital experience and then also into a safe, uh, actually as, as joyous can be in these times, uh, experience where, for example, if you look around the world, there's super retail group out, out of Australia, for example, is an exceptional is an exceptional case of how do you operate in in their case what's starting to look like a post COVID world because their numbers are so low that they're opening up general retail but they've learned a lot along the way. Yeah. So and, and I was I had that slide in there for life scale um, because it's an excellent book and it's now more relevant today I think than when you wrote it last year because it's about you know our basically how our shortened attention spans, declines in critical thinking, a lack of sleep, self-doubt, that's basically been caused by all the digital distraction. And now we're blurring the lines between, you know, work from home and kind of, you know, the, 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 the home life balance has definitely been shifted for a lot of people, um, coupled with the anxiety of all the uncertainty with COVID. Um, so, you know, I definitely would encourage people to check it out. They can get it on Amazon. Um, Lifescale, and you have another another other books um, on there that, that, that people can go through. Um, you know, just one more thing on human centered design. Um, that's something that you've been you've been very focused on um, over the past few years. So, how do you think? You know, again, going back to the consumer, right? Understanding when you're thinking about new stores and different formats moving forward, you have to really take into all, all these things in consideration. There's a lot of moving pieces. Yeah, but, yeah. Keep going. 
So, with you. yeah. So, so, so on that note, I do want to welcome now um, Vibhu, uh, Vibhu Norby, who's the CEO and founder of Beta. Um, Vibhu actually spoke at retail spaces a couple of years ago and, you know, has a really um, uh, tech folk, you know, he's an engineer that came into retail. Um, so I'm going to play the little promo video now. We're going to bring Vibhu on. Um, we're going to talk to him about Beta and then we'll open up for a conversation. But uh, Brian, we'll keep you on here as well. Um, let's let's get, get a dialogue going. So let's see if this works. <laughs> you got to da dance in, Vibhu. Hey, man. Hey. Sorry. I so, like that. So again, uh, just before we get started, uh, apologies. I know that there's been some issues with tech, and I think, Vibhu, you had some coming in, but you're the tech guy. Have you figured out any? Can you tell the people tuning in what they can do to make it better? <laughs> yeah, I... It wasn't me. It was Jason. Uh, it was Jason. That's uh, what I learned. Yeah. Well, hey, man, th thanks for joining us. Um, you know, we, we wanted to have a, a retailer on, right, because you're living this. Uh, and you and I had a conversation just the other day. Um, and uh, I did bring up one thing because I saw you quoted an article um, probably a few weeks ago. And again, we know, all know that a few weeks is uh, like years yeah. at this point. But you said that, that you you criticize the industry for having bizarre optimism about where the the rebound, I guess, was going to be. Um, do you still think we have bizarre optimism? Uh, yeah, and I'll and I'll say that I'm one of those people that had bizarre optimism because I was looking at our numbers six ish weeks ago, and and I saw a recovery happening, and we track everything, and it was pretty clear there was people were coming back at a consistent pace. Mm -hmm. And it felt bizarre because it didn't feel like we actually had solved any issues. It were just decided that we didn't care anymore. Um, and and yeah. that had, yeah, I think that just kind of put us back to where we are today where uh, traffic has dropped again. And I, I, I don't think it's just us. I think a lot of retailers are seeing comps going down again. Yeah. Uh, and there's a ton of fear out there and people are not gonna go to stores if they're fearful. So um, I was right. I wish I hadn't been, but uh, well, but now I, I think you said that it's, now it's just bizarre. You've taken the optimism, yeah, yeah. And we're just <laughs> bizarre. Uh, but for, con for context, for people that are not familiar about beta, can you just give a little background? Uh, tell about the sure. size of your portfolio and a little about the concept. Yeah, so we're we're still a pretty small retailer. We're twenty two stores in the U.S. We have one, one in Dubai. We have two opening in Tokyo in nine days, okay. um, and we are the pioneers of a model called retail as a service, which was uh, five years ago, pretty novel. And now you see tons and tons of startups and a lot of big retailers are doing this as well. But rather than buying products at wholesale, we were renting space in our stores to brands and giving them 100% of the sales they generated. Mm -hmm. And in exchange for that, um, that subscription fee that, that we called it, uh, we provide them uh, crazy amounts of data on how their products and brand was performing in our stores. We gave them all kinds of omni-channel tools and overall overall kind of built a uh, a software framework around our stores that allowed brands to have as much control as they would have if they were building their own stores. Okay. We were really focused on tech. As you know, we helped relaunch Toys R Us last year. Mm -hmm. uh, we launched an apparel concept called Forum. Uh, we've kind of been exploring uh, all manner of other uh, categories that we could apply this vision to. Yeah. Um, and yeah, that's that's kind of a bit about beta. Okay, and I think from what I understand, all your stores are reopened domestically, with the exception of Hudson Yards, New York. That's yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, uh, our we have two stores in New York in an enclosed mall, and the governor has not yet allowed indoor malls to open. Yeah, well, I'm here in New York. Hopefully, that that'll be soon. I think we're we're almost there. Um, so, on the topic of uh, you know, the optimism where things are going, how, how has, I guess, foot traffic been for you? I mean, uh, across the board, uh, what, any numbers you want to share or don't want to share? I mean, is, how, how challenging has it really been? Because your, your story is all about discoverability. Yeah, um, and, yeah. You know, I, I'm, I'm happy to share some numbers. I mean, uh, if, if, if like, I don't know how many people are on this call, but if everyone can keep it confidential. Yeah, um, I mean, we... <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, so that so we were seeing... <laughs> Yeah, so when we first opened, um, our, our first stores opened in Texas, and we saw a recovery about 10% a week, but it was on a baseline of practically zero. So 
that, you know, if 11 mm -hmm. people came in, then, then 12 people came in the next week. Uh, and that was kind of continuing. Uh, what we saw really quickly was transaction volume being restored. And I think for a lot of retailers, that's pretty good news. Like I think we were seeing 60 to 70% of GMV was mm -hmm. coming back online from a much, much lower traffic base, which really just meant that we were losing all the window shoppers. They weren't coming in, yeah. which makes sense. And no one's um, going to stores just to look around right now, right? You're going with intention and a mission. Yep. And people were also spending more when they came in on average, a lot mm -hmm. more. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned, kind of over the last couple of weeks, um, you know, uh, on, uh, on average across our stores that are open, traffic's down 88% year over year. So one out of every 10 people that used to come in is coming in now. Wow. Transaction volume still pretty steady, but no. um, but yeah, that's a that's a really tough situation, you know, for sure. Well, yeah, well, you guys are doing some really cool things, which I want to get to in a minute. But before we get into that, I want to hit back on what I uh, I guess I teased when we were talking with Brian, and it's on you know safety. And you guys have probably some of the most stringent measures in place to ensure safety of your associates and your customers. Can you share uh, kind of what you guys are doing? Yeah, sure. So before we, uh, we're not, a, we don't sell essential goods. And I, as I mentioned to you the other day, that was our thing. Like we, we sell things you don't need and, yeah. and we were proud of that. Um, and of course, uh, retailers that didn't sell things that were needed, um, weren't allowed to open. So we had a lot of time to think very carefully about how, how we might operate stores and, and, and realistically keep our associates safe. Um, but also ensure that customers felt like they were going to be safe before they came in. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we we actually did research on hundreds of retailers uh, through the pandemic. And a lot of the people that were open were grocery, pharmacy, um, you know, things like that. And and we kind of watched how their safety practices evolved over months. Yeah. And then we ended up actually publishing that research to shopsafely.co. Yep, got the slide uh, up. <laughs> nice. Um, and uh, if your rating, I know we have retailers on this call. If your rating is, you don't like your rating, I can tell you exactly why that, that is because your policies are not clearly available on your site somewhere. Mm -hmm. So we, it's, these, these are pulled uh, from retailers' websites. We don't crawl corporate statements and things like that. They have to be available prominently somewhere on your site for consumers. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I think what's really great is that, um, most of the retailers, the large retailers in the country now are actually providing very, very safe environments, at least from a corporate policy level. Yeah. Um, we're not going into every store and checking, you know, whether people are actually social distancing, whether masks are actually being required. Uh, but, but overall, uh, th this needs to be updated. So we yeah, have to stop I, just, I, just <laughs> I just want to point out yeah. here that we pulled this like a couple of weeks ago. So I know okay. that because it. it's in there, but yeah, yeah. I think uh, it would, it doesn't update in real time, right? We actually go in and scan these sites um, about once a week and then update. So um, we we wanted to know like what were all the possible things we could be doing, and 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 then we sort of picked most of them up uh, that kind of made sense for our environment. Mm -hmm. um, so today, um, you know, the associates were doing everything. Obviously, mass required temperature checks in the morning, health surveys every day. Um, we also have a limited, a much more limited staff that's coming into stores. Uh, we have all kinds of policies. If someone does get COVID or the roommate gets COVID, um, we have different kind of policies there. We have sick pay, all that kind of stuff. Um, for customers, though, the experience is dramatically different because when you come to our store, you are going to be the only person in the store. If you come with your family, you'll be the only group in the store. And that means that you're going to get an amazing personal experience, but it also allows us to monitor every single thing that you're interacting with. And we do a hard sanitation between customers. So we're going to go and sanitize every surface that you touched, every product that you touched in your journey. But you can touch things. And that's, I think, something that we really ha we had to get to a place where our safety protocols allow people to get their hands on products. Otherwise, they should just you know shop on the Internet. Yeah, well, and that's it. And you're an experiential retailer. And that's what we've been talking about, right, for the past few years is how to make it more of an experience and really engage the customers. So it's important that you guys keep doing that. So it's great that you know you have those measures in place. And I think... The Shop Safely site is a great resource to people. We can put that in the chat for people to, to take a look. And if you're any retailers and you disagree, 
you can go to Vibu directly and, uh, and, and complain. Um, <laughs> I've had uh, a lot of those. You know, again, talking about the future, right? Because I think I think there's definitely some fatigue um, on yeah. you know, reopening and doing things. I think you know, if you haven't figured that out by now, um, you know, that's 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 a problem. But looking to the future, I mean, I, I know that you know you guys, and I think uh, someone just put it in here. Someone, uh, Jennifer uh, Porteous, is saying, curious about how customers have received your virtual consultations. So I did read, the, I read an article the other day about a, a consumer that went on to the beta site and, mm -hmm. you know, said that there was somebody that they were not going to go out to any physical stores or anything like that, but they were just testing around and they were so, saw a coffee maker that you guys were selling. I think you saw from a tweet that you put out and he had a virtual oh, yeah. consultation with an associate in one of your stores. And he said it was one of the coolest things out there. So yeah. why don't you share that with the audience? I think that that's uh, pretty interesting. And what is your plans to roll that out or, you know, make that part of, uh, you know, are, are you going to be doing more of that, I guess? Yeah, we're super focused on video uh, in different formats. So both, um, you know, produced videos around products where you can see how they work, but also live streams with our companies, with our store associates, with our founders. Um, and then these personal one-to-one -one virtual shopping appointments where you're going to connect with someone in one of our stores who has the product, um, has inventory, Mm -hmm. uh, and and usually we'll connect you to someone who uh, has a passion for that product and is an expert. Um, and yeah, so there's uh, I, I tweeted about this product called Frank One. It's a vacuum coffee brewer that sucks the coffee out of um, out of uh, the the grinds, and so you get no acidity. It's an amazing product out of Colombia, of all places. Um, and uh, and they do have obviously wonderful coffee. <laughs> in but Columbia, they but, don't have good internet because that's where Jason is right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right on. Um, and, and, you know, we have a uh, store up in uh, Northern California where I think a lot of the team have been uh, coffee baristas in the past and are passionate about coffee. And I think uh, this individual had connected with uh, one of those folks and, and he had been, uh, you know, enjoying the product at home that we had introduced, but also mm -hmm. uh, uh, he had been hacking it and trying to figure out interesting ways to use it that kind of were on off the record. And, and I know the person had a great experience and ended up buying the product, but uh, that kind of experience you would normally have in our store. That's, that is the experience of shopping in beta. Um, but uh, being able to deliver 70% of that online is, is pretty good. Of course, you're missing the taste of the coffee. You're missing the smell of the coffee. Um, there, are, there are things that just um, can't be done over video and that's regretful, but yeah, uh, but we're it's a great experience and, and we're never it's never going away. And so, um, you know, I think that's and, and you'll see us, you know, I, I kind of mentioned to you the other day, like we're live streaming is going to be a huge deal for us. We're hoping to basically turn every single one of our stores into a production studio where we can flip live to at any time on our site for a customer and get a hands on engagement with something. That's, yeah. that's the kind of thing that that, you know, we're sort of going for right now. Yeah, so explain that because that to me sounds. I mean, I saw that we 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 hit on this in a rollout a few uh, probably a couple months back. But how Alibaba was doing live streaming, uh, you know, and some of the, with, with some of their yeah. stores, and uh, you know, we're so, as a live event producer, as you see, you know, we're we're now realizing we have to use these tools to keep people connected. Yeah. So we're all we're so, all going down that that path. But you've come from a technology background, so what what are your plans? Yeah, I, so Brian is uh, what what we just saw with Brian is a great example of someone who. Uh, you know, I think all of us are sitting at home. Look at me. I have got a like my I'm in my kid's room. Um, I have a white background um, because I'm still expecting to go back to the office one day. I haven't invested in this space as, you know, a, a background for my face, which is going to be on a computer screen, you know, 10 hours mm -hmm. a day. But Brian carved out a space in his house. He got the equipment. He painted the room. I don't, maybe it was already painted. Um, that's that's the that's sort of embracing that this is the next level. And I think for us, we started with let's get people on camera in our stores connected to a customer. The next step is, okay, well, how do we make that singular experience really, really good? Um, and so that it requires us to be more thoughtful about how we produce the environment that our staff mm -hmm. are sitting in, how we make products more accessible to them, um, how we stage the demo experience. Um, so we're, we're diving into a bunch of store design ideas and, and, I actually, I have no idea if I'm answering your question. I, I think I had a pre prepared no, no, no. thing to say, but, but, um, but yeah, I, I, like we're we're trying to be, uh, like you said in the very beginning, right? Uh, about new normal. 
And I, I think we're trying to enter the phase where this is life now, and we've got to figure out how we adjust to a low traffic environment uh, and and take some of these experiences that we're building and make them native to how our stores um, are designed and how they operate. So, so perfect segue. So that was my next question for you. So if we're anticipating, you know, much lower traffic, and again, not across every category, but for specialty retail, I know that you guys are doing appointment based, right? So people that want to come in, they can do appointments to come into the store and, you, and you're managing that. Um, with that, that's an opportunity to maybe, you know, have a more customized and really, you know, uh, you know, take the time to really get to understand your customers and really, you know, uh, make it more personalized. Uh, yeah. You know, so if you're going to see less foot traffic coming through malls, like what, do you, what are the opportunities do you see there? Not only just for yourself, but for other retailers. So that, that, that's two questions. Yeah. So what are you going to do to take, you know, to, to make the best, uh, you know, of that opportunity with lower foot traffic? But what do you think other retailers should be thinking about? You know, if you were a mall-based apparel retailer or a specialty retailer. We are. Funnily enough, we, oh, right. we, have, we, doing, yeah, we have two yeah. other apparel stores yeah. launching yeah. soon, but we are aware of that. Yeah, yeah. So I think the for us, it's you know we're we're looking at data and we're saying okay, we used to have in our New York store, for example, um, around fifty thousand visitors a month. It was a huge amount of traffic. That's not a normal store, but um, it was a lot. And if I'm looking at the data and I and I can kind of you know especially in a city like New York, I can imagine that there's going to be maybe 5,000 people in a month, right? And if you kind of break that down and you start looking hourly, we're starting to get to a point where I think we should expect that we're going to have one, two, three people in the store at a time, even mm -hmm. once we get kind of out of the immediate danger zone. And uh, and normally that would be a problem in our in our kind of normal construction of our store, right? You're going to walk around and it's kind of cavernous and um, and it doesn't have that exciting feel of a store when there's when it's busy. Um, but I think we can build something that, uh, you know, what if when you come into the store and you're the only one, like we are, we have completely personalized the store for you, right? When you, before you came, you booked your appointment, you told us what you were looking for, who you were buying for, what you're interested in. And when you walked in, imagine apparel. Um, and this is something I've pitched like 50 times to people to, to try to, um, entrepreneurs that like, I want someone to build this, but um, if we could figure out who you were and when you walked in, everything in the store was in your size, like every shoe you could actually put on and it fits you every piece of clothing. And maybe there were less of them, but they're all in your style. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you had someone there who was, who uh, was really there just to serve you uh, and served you beverages. All Like, I think there's a chance to dive into personalization in a way that, um, no one has ever thought before uh, to do. And uh, you get that only at the very highest end of retail. And that's just because there are few, very few shoppers at that high end. And so you mm -hmm. get a great experience. But one could deliver a really magnificent experience in 10 minute increments um, for a customer. And, and the store design has to change because we all design them for a browsing behavior and having lots of people in them. But maybe if you're coming in uh, to the store and it was a much more personal experience, your first experience is actually checking in with someone and, you know, having a space reserved for you where when you walked in there, you're getting that kind of personal experience. So we're looking at things like this and, um, and I think you'll see us in the next year get super, super creative with even store expansion. Uh, we're mm -hmm. not going to build stores the same way in the future. Sure. That, that's for sure. So just being conscious of time here. So, I mean, th that sounds, I mean, if I'm a consumer, that's that's an opportunity for me to get me to come into the store to have that personalized experience. But the economics of doing something like that in a Hudson Yards, for example, assuming that, you know, you can work something out with related, um, but it's not necessarily, you know, uh, is the economics of looking at that, is there more opportunity to invest yeah. more in the virtual uh, video, you know, uh, consultations versus the in-store. And I guess that, that, you know, to answer for, I, I guess I answer that in my head is a lot of the products you have, you want to touch and feel, you want to smell the coffee, yeah. right? you want to do different things. But Kurt Brooks is asking a question here too, is that, you know, it's great with small retail, but how do you roll something like that, that out for a chain that has thousands of stores? You know, I think um, I, this is like a classic, um, innovator question and it happens regardless of there's what is the pandemic right like everything great starts small and yeah uh, but with with a group that has conviction um you know i i think the reality is that uh most big retailers won't figure this out 
and they're going to be replaced by smaller ones. That's mm-hmm. the real answer. I think, you know, if there is an opportunity inside of a bigger retailer to do this, um, I've seen some large retailers roll out some amazing projects at scale really quickly because they do have the capability to operationalize new protocols really quickly. I mean, look what we've done with safety across the country. Like we, you know, have reconfigured stores in some, and I think like some of the retailers have moved aisles further apart and like, done tremendous work to keep people safe. Um, so everything is possible if, as long as you're, as you're okay with it being small in the beginning. Yeah. Um, you know, I, 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 um, I don't, I, I, I feel for the large retailers. I mean, I, I, I totally agree. Everything is much, much easier for us when, I mean, because we're much smaller and we have fewer people on site, but, um, you know, uh, I think there's also an opportunity for large retailers to roll out new store formats. I don't think you have to be bound to those four walls. And to your point about related and landlords, I know you're trying to wrap this up. Sorry. Um, no, no, no. You <laughs> just, just brought up another thing because we have a poll. Are you considering changing your store format? So yeah. let's just throw that one up there now and yes. people answer that because I think that that's another thing is that, you know, we'll see a lot of retailers and we see yeah. it now already, people testing smaller formats and, uh, yeah. And looking at you know now really investing in potential showrooms. So, um, so I think that economics are the top part, right? And and if we kind of dig into economics. It's, I mean, all of the costs of a retailer are in two buckets. It's really staffing and and our leases, right? And and so you know right now we're entering an environment with commercial real estate where I just don't think that the old rules of of how leases work are going to apply in the future. And if someone is looking at expanding today, I, I, I don't know, I don't think, I've not been in the industry that long, but but this environment is unlike anything I've ever seen in terms of yeah. the kinds of deals that are being made. And, um, and, and there's just truthfully a lot of space coming online that's pre-built and looks great, but there's no one there to lease it, right? So um, this gives retailers, I think, an opportunity to experiment. Mm-hmm. And on the staffing side, you know, I think, um, you know, retailers are constantly trying to find ways to reduce their staff and they've been doing that successfully for 20 years to the detriment of store experiences. But, yeah. um, but you know, if you're trying to deliver a more personalized experience, you actually don't need as many people because you can have one person that's, you know, assigned to a single brand. You can limit how much traffic and how many people you're trying to take into the store. Yeah. Um, but it, it's, it, uh, there's no doubt it's tough economically right now because we are in a, you know, in a world where you have less traffic and, and just less sales and you have all these same old costs, that's not super sustainable long-term. But I think some of that will be worked out in the next year. Yeah, so I'm gonna ask Brian to, to join us again. Brian, if you're still hanging out in the background there, thanks, Brian's kind of been also been serving, I guess, as a little moderator there, moving some questions around. So as Brian brings his camera back on, there is one question, more question for you, Vibu, it's on, after customers have their video chat with the sales rep, are you then increasing your shipping speed to compete with Amazon, <laughs> uh, I, I mean, yeah, I like. Let's be real. Like, no, no one can compete with Amazon on that. <laughs> I, I'm not like. I don't have you know hundreds oh, wait, of wait, millions of dollars to spend. But now you're just taking the same thing that you know. If you're big, you can't do innovative things. Well, I'm. Not, but I. But to me, <laughs> that isn't the thing that we ever wanted to deliver on, right? And I, and like we, we don't want to compete with Amazon, and we are trying to play a different game, which is focused on discovery and. Mm-hmm. And we're totally okay if people go and buy an Amazon. We have a business model that's a little different. Sure. Well, Brian, thanks for, uh, for, for hanging out in the background there. You know, I, I have a question for both of you. You know, we started this off, you know, we're talking about a lot of challenges here. And, let, you know, the reality is, is that retail is going to go, you know, it's going to take a long time for, for things to, you know, correct in some way or maybe, maybe never correct. So, uh, Vibhu, I asked you this last the other day, you know, and you said, you know, again, around the topic of motivating teams and keeping people, keep people aware is that you said something that, that kind of resonated with me, because even for us as an organization, for people that know us, you know, we produce live events. We can't do that anymore, you know, for the foreseeable future. I think, yeah. you know, and I don't want let to you, let you talk about it, but, you know, you said something out of the fact is like, if you accept the reality now and just embrace it, then it's a lot easier than waking up every day. And just going, oh my God, when is this going to be over? Um, so, you know, any parting yeah. words from both of you, the audience, that you know, um, yeah, that's it. I don't want to lead it any further. Yeah. So, I think that I've had like a thousand percent increase year over year in my usage of the phrase uh, "things are crazy," right? Or not knowing how to answer the question, "How are you doing?" Right? And everyone's like, "Well, you know, I'm good." you know, but obviously there's, there's always like a butt in there. And, 
And I'm trying to stop saying that because I think, um, I think that's, you know, sort of attaching you to the past and we're, and we're, we're not going back there, you know, and, and, and I'm not even sure we liked it that much anyway, right? The grass is always greener. And I think um, for me and, and, and with my team um, and I'm, I'm the, I'm a huge offender here. Like I, I, I'm, I'll be honest, like it's waking up sometimes and looking at our numbers and I'm, I'm just, Oh my God, like what's happened, what's happening. Right. Yeah. But, um, but I, the only way, the only real way for me to overcome those um, is, is exactly that, which is stop saying this is crazy and look at everything that's happening and understand this is probably what's, what it's going to look like for a long time. And it may never look any different. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think there's, you know, if you, if you under appreciate that, um, you can start to see that there's lots and lots of opportunity to be um, had here because um, I, I, I for sure can tell you that 95% of the other people out there are, are sitting there still attached to the past. And, yeah. um, and, you know, they're just, uh, there is there is room to to do some cool things, and I think you're going to see uh, what I mean very very specifically in the next month. We've got some projects I just think are going to blow people's minds um, in terms of like what a retailer should be doing to adjust for this situation. Um, and uh, and it's just from it was really just from us stop feeling you know stop not feeling bad about everything and, yeah. and moving forward. So yeah, that's great. So Brian, just we only got a couple minutes here. What, what what would you say? Some parting words to kind of you know about the situation, this situation. <laughs> well, uh, uh, plus one to everything that Vibu just uh, shared. That's it's all really important. Look, like we talked about earlier, this disruption was already happening. Uh, consumers were expe ex expecting and demanding better experiences, like they were getting online uh, to compete with Amazon. Uh, you know, a, a twenty year old startup. Is, is is a fool's game uh looking at ways to deliver new and exceptional experiences even if you have to do it small if you're a large retailer to explore uh new new possibilities and build that expertise internally is a great way but the only way to start is to look at what's happening with your customers that from a data standpoint and humanize it i call it data-driven empathy humanize that data so it inspires you gives you purpose so that you can let go of the past and give yourself purpose moving forward yeah that's no, a perfect way to tie it up um, we've just got a couple of minutes left here and I know we can stay on for another minute, but I know people probably have maybe another webinar or a Zoom meeting to go into because that's, that's the, the world we're living in here. Um, I'm going to use this opportunity just to address um, one thing and that's just kind of our plans at the moment. We've been you know, in the background trying to figure out what to do and you know, we're hoping that had some bizarre optimism um, that maybe by the fall things were going to get a little bit better and that we had the potential to run events and we all know that that's just, you know, unfortunately, it's not the case. So we've been doing our own digital pivot and testing out, you know, doing webinars. And again, thank you guys for joining us, Te you know, figuring out the tech. Maybe it's not this platform because I see some people and especially had some tech issues on this one. Um, but we're learning and uh, it's an opportunity. And we, you know, we've accepted the fact that this is going to be the way it is, unfortunately, probably for, you know, a year or so. Um, you know, maybe coming into the end, somewhere into the new year, we'll be able to start doing small gatherings. But um, for those that are curious, we will be announcing... Um, you check the retail spaces site um, in the next week. We'll have more details, but we're going to be doing retail spaces almost live. Um, and that is Thursday. We'll start September 24th. The good news is we're not going to try to take a three day event and an expo hall and move it online and think people are going to show up to that because they're not. So anybody else is telling you they're doing that. Good luck. Um, but we've been spending a lot of time just talking to the retailers and people in general and have a number of different digital solutions to keep people connected and informed. Um, so. Awesome. Stay tuned for that. Um, again, guys, for, for joining us, um, Brian, I, I hope one day I'll be able to come check out your studio in Tahoe. Cause <laughs> that's, that's a, that's I have a question. How far does, and, how far and, does the blue extend outside of the camera? Is it all, all the way to the uh, wall? My hand over here and my hand uh -huh. over here. And did you paint it yourself or? No, it's, it's a it, backdrop. It's, it's a, a pull, pull up now. <laughs> you you should share a link where we can get one of those. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, have, I have a feeling in the next few months, everybody's going to be investing more in these uh, these setups. Um, and, and it'll be amazing to see that the tech, as it's actually gotten so much better just for meetings 
um, virtually um, in, in a few months from now, we'll be looking back on man, how much innovations happened just in this in this space. And uh, Vibhu, uh, you you keep well because I know you've got a a new new baby that's only you know less than two weeks old. So Congrats. thanks. Congrats. Thank you. And thanks to your son, right, um, for uh, mm -hmm. for not crying through the webinar. So, I know he was crying. I was. <laughs> he <just> got <laughs> <laughs> you got some good soundproofing in there. Um, all right, guys, listen. Thanks so much, and uh, keep safe. All right, take care. Hi, right, you too. Thank you.